Drummers, everyone is teaching this stretch and this stretch and the stick stretch, and I want to tell you why you should not be doing it for multiple reasons and an alternative and a step-by-step -step method that you can use to make a great change. But just really quick, can we all just admire this black badge DW Edge with crazy copper hardware? Ooh, refinishing this bad boy. All right, let's jump right into the stretching conversation. So if you've been here for a while, you know I do not like stretching and I really think drummers should avoid it. And I wanna make sure I say this, this is not my personal bias. You can do a ton of research on this and you'll see both of my arguments here. So I have two strong arguments why you shouldn't be stretching and then an alternative. Now, first and foremost, the reason why I talk about stretching so much is if you even just think about kind of the colloquial verbiage around it, stretching is associated with relaxing your muscles and lengthening your muscles, which is all great. Let's just talk about one thing. When we're playing the drums and you're doing any rudiments or any sort of patterns, whatever it is you may be doing, ultimately, we want to do everything we can so we can play precisely, confidently, strong, and have stamina and experience no injuries. We want as much stability as possible. Stretching does not help with any of those goals, contrary to popular belief. So let's go with this. Number one. Stretching, there are two different types of stretching. There's something called active stretching versus passive stretching. If I just sit here and I move my wrist like so, this is called active range of motion or could be considered active stretching. I'm going to a lengthened position, lengthening these muscles and actively stretching. I don't think there's anything wrong with this. I'll tell you why we're not going to do this in a moment. The thing that you see most people do is what's called passive stretching. And so it's I have this joint range of motion. I can only go to here based off of my joint architecture and what my muscles will allow me to do. My central nervous system will only let me go this far. And then I grab an external force, my hand, and I apply myself further. The question I would ask you is a couple things. One, if my body can only go this far right now, is it wise to push it further than it can go voluntarily? If my car door can only open so far, but I go, you know what, I want it to open further, I'm not going to sit there and push on the door more and more and more because it actually pushes on the architecture of the door and over time it'll break. So the question is, when I have decreased range of motion, I can't go further than this, is it a problem? Because if I have a little less range of motion than you, it may be my individual anatomy. My bones, my soft tissue may not let me go further. In fact, I can't go to 90 degrees because I actually have a ganglion cyst from weightlifting when I was in my 20s. The other side of it is that my muscles, muscles voluntarily can only contract so well to this position. Is forcing them to go further going to actually allow them to go further? So we already have this one idea. One, if I can only go so far, I don't want to push further than my joints will allow me to go because I actually don't know what I'm shoving myself into. I don't know what force is going on here. For me, if you stretch me, my ganglion cyst will blow up and I won't be able to play drums for weeks. So passive stretching for me is a bad idea. The reason why I tell you that is you may not have cysts like me, but you need to understand your history to see what do you have going on. And if you don't know, do you really want to take the risk of jamming on it? Number two, which is actually the more important reason, there is a lot of research showing that when you lengthen skeletal muscle and you stretch it and pull on it, that it actually decreases force production. It can actually decrease rate of force development and decrease endurance of associated muscle. Why this is so important is because if we're thinking about precision, whatever it is you're trying to do, we wanna make sure that you can perform at a very high level consistently. If we decrease your force production, strength, your endurance, and your rate of force production, you are going to perform less well. Now, there's this thing that happens, and it's called post-activation potentiation. Post-activation potentiation. After you contract a muscle, there is a potentiation, an increase in potential of that muscle, and you can learn about it in a lot of different various athletics. But this phenomenon is an acute response that happens after there is a stimulus. So what I'm not telling you is warming up for drumming is not important. In fact, warming up for drumming, in my opinion, is important. But I'm telling you, the colloquial ways of doing it, the stretching further than you can go, is risky and does not do what you think it does most of the time. Now, I'll say this as a caveat if anybody's truly deep into the academic world. 
There are instances in small cases where passive stretching actually is very beneficial to certain tissues and specific types of tissue. And there's a paper on that, which I think is a very cool study showing how one ligament in the body responds really well to stretching in a therapeutic sense, and another one does not and stiffens up. The reason why I don't tell you which one it is because I don't want you to start yanking on your body. You can do your own research and you can ask some questions below. But more importantly, think about it this way. If there's one ligament that is academically proven to stretch well and one that actually seizes up and gets worse and you don't know which one it is, do you really want to be jamming on all your tendons because we don't know how they're all going to respond? The risk is too high. So here's what I'm going to advocate for you to do. I showed you this active range of motion before, right? Active stretching. This is very powerful. The only challenge that comes up with this that is a really minute detail is that when I lift my wrist up, when torque, gravity, and center of mass is not at play, it's the top concentric joint versus, sorry, top of the muscles versus bottom muscle. When I go back, it's either my ability of these muscles to contract and pull me further or these ones' ability to lengthen there. So if we really want to try and bias the muscles, if we can, I like to try and remove the tug of war of the top and bottom muscles. This is my personal bias. So I will say you can just move your wrist. But here's what I've been teaching most of the professional drummers that I've been working with lately, and they've been really responding well. Very simple potentiation exercises. So post-activation, potentiation, preparation is what we're doing. We're preparing the muscles for contractions. And so instead of just going forward and playing a rudiment, which you can do, I would encourage you to try and do a couple exercises, and I'm going to show you three of them that you can do very simply with drumsticks on a pad, and this principle applies across the board. So there's not an exercise that's perfect. You can apply this principle across the board. What we're going to try to do, and this helps with the post-activation potentiation phenomenon, is we're going to contract muscles in a short duration at a high level without pain or without fatigue. As soon as we experience fatigue or pain, pain, our body starts to decrease in force production. So what I'm going to do, the first exercise is extremely simple. I'm going to grab the stick with whatever techni technique feels comfortable. I'm going to move the stick down. I'm going to hit the head. And from my hand technique, I'm going to just try and push the stick down as hard as I can. So I'm doing it with both hands. And I'm going to push down as hard as I can. One, two, rest. That's it. Shoving down, keep your tech, get your fulcrums nice and firm, fingers tight, and shove down from the wrist. One, two, rest. You'll feel if you do this, the thumbs, the index finger, everything has to work pretty hard and go. One, two, rest. Perfect. You've already done it. Now we're going to do another one. The next one is we're going to do one at a time. We're going to come back to the wrist extension that I showed you, but instead of just hanging out here, we're going to place my hand on the top of the stick, and I'm going to try and continue traveling back this way with the stick. So I'm going to push back and go, one, two, rest. Now, if it pinches here a little bit, I'm sorry about that. Come down a little, stay away from the pinch and do it again. One, two, rest. You want to try and feel some of these extensor muscles. Try it again. One, two, rest. So we're going to do each of these five times for two seconds. Now, if you're a real keener, the third one that I like to teach is to grab the sticks with really bad technique, like you're going to do chopsticks. I'm just kidding. And what we're going to do is you're going to hold your elbows firm at your side, and we're going to turn your hands in. Now, I'm a little too far here. I move my hands down, and what I'm trying to do is continue turning into the pad. So this is going to get all of these pronator muscles. So elbows in tight and push down. One, two, rest. Now, I'll be honest. This is a little too high for me, and that's why you see my elbows coming out. With your elbows down low, it's much easier to do it on a proper practice pad. So I'll try it from here. Turning. One, two, rest. One, two, rest. Good. Once you do these three, this is what I would encourage you to pick up a uh, rudiment that you like to do and practice doing that a little bit, and you'll already feel the big difference there. Here's the thing, and you're going to see a bunch of experiments with, with experiments with this really soon. I bought a brand new dynamometer, and that's a force gauge that measures force differences. I am going to show you all as soon as it gets here in a little story how this makes a huge difference for force production. If you follow these post-activation potentiation rules, you'll increase in strength, speed, and endurance, and honestly, you'll get more muscle by doing it this way. You'll also stay away from the risky stretching. I hope this was valuable to you. I promise I have some personal thoughts around stretching, but I'm not trying to teach those. What I want to share with you are the two things that one, they are risky on your joints. Two, it doesn't do to your muscles what you think it does. There's actually a whole other litany of things that come from passive stretching that is not beneficial for you. But at the end of the day, this is your own adventure. So I'll say this to close out today. If you've been stretching for years and you just love it, and you have no problem with it, and you have no quantifiable data suggesting that you should stop doing it, keep doing you. I don't want to just, I'm not trying to push my bias upon you. And at this moment, I have no financial incentive in this world. I'm just trying to share information to help you guys out. But at the end of the day, 
Thank you all for watching. This is Brandon from Drum Mechanics. My Instagram, at Drum Mechanics, is blowing up right now. Please check it out. There's daily tips there. I appreciate you all. Stronger drummers play longer. Let's go.